Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of Z80 Dreams. I left you on a bit of a cliffhanger last time with the keyboard repair of the ABC80. I haven't given up on it though, I have ordered spare parts and in fact I'm waiting for them to arrive. I was thinking, while we wait for the spare parts, why not make a video about a totally different computer system. So, today I'm going to speak about the Commodore uh, Amiga 500. And a little bit about the 500 plus, but not as much. But first things first. You might wonder, if this is a story about the Amiga 500, why do I have a Commodore 64 t-shirt? Well, there are two reasons for that. The first reason is, I don't have an Amiga uh, t-shirt. The second reason is, as you can see, Commodore was actually the company that later sold the Amigas. It's a very interesting story, a story that involves a company called High Toro, Larry Kappen, Jay Miner and Bert Braddock, all very important persons working at High Toro, developing the Amiga, the original Amiga. Under that time it was going under the codename Lorraine. Jack Trammell leaving Commodore was also very interesting and very important part of the story. He founded his own company, Tremel Technologies, which later bought uh, Atari when it got into financial crisis during the video game crash uh, in the mid 80s. So I'm not going to tell the entire story, but uh, if you want to find out more how Commodore got to get hold of the Amiga system and how they swooped in and snatched it out of the hand of uh, Atari, just like uh, greedy kid sweeping out and taking the last ice cream bit, <laughs> if you like. If you want to know more about that, I recommend the Commodore History Series by 8-Bit Guy. And especially the episode focusing on the birth of the Amiga, of course. But what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm mainly going to talk about the 500. And I'm going to talk about this mystery letter I got. Oops. What it contains. And I'm gonna try out some games. Maybe this one. Maybe this one. Maybe this one. Or maybe this one. But before I start with any of that, I need a cup of coffee. It's like new life pouring into me. <laughs> anyway, some time ago I was thinking I want to play A-Train and just relax. And I was sure that I could play it because on the box it says like this. Amiga 500, 600, 1000, 2000, 2500, 3000 and 4. Wow, that's a lot of models of Amigas that you can play this on. One megabyte of RAM required for low resolution graphics. One megabyte of RAM plus uh, 512 kilobyte of fast RAM required for high resolution graphics. And I have one megabyte of RAM in this. At least I think that I do. So I was thinking, well, I can play the low resolution game. You see this model, uh, and this revision, it came with 512 uh, kilobyte of RAM on the board. There are some earlier Amiga 500s that only came with 256 kilobyte of RAM on the board, but this is a revision 5 and it has 512 kilobyte of RAM on the motherboard. Under this one, you have a little slot, a trapdoor, 
And inside that trapdoor is a module where you can install extra memory. So there is a memory module in here that adds additionally 512 kilobyte of RAM to the machine. So let's check out what's underneath this trapdoor. You just take a big screwdriver, a flathead screwdriver, and try to open it from this side where this little slot is. You can open it by putting your nail there and pushing, but I have very short nails, so I find a screwdriver approach more easy. Uh -huh. And this is, in fact, an original memory expansion that came with the Amiga 500 Plus that I have. So I just swapped it and uh, yeah, put it into this machine instead. While I swapped it, I noticed that the barrel battery that is supposed to be located here was leaking. And you can see the damage that the battery acid has done to it. So I was thinking, well, I can try it anyway. I uh, soldered the battery. Uh, I cleaned it up with some electronic cleaner and some alcohol, and I put it in the Amiga 500 like that. And I booted it into Workbench, which is the operating system of the Amiga. And it reported a full one uh, megabyte of RAM. So, well, it seems like everything was working. 512 from this module and 512 from the system board. One meg in total. But then when I tried starting a train it didn't work. Uh, I constantly got error messages that there is not enough memory and an error message saying, are you sure that you have one meg of memory, etc. So I'm suspecting that this is, well, that the acid from the battery has eaten up some of the traces and that all of the memory cells are not working as they should. Or that they are working sometimes, or maybe sometimes not working. Well, nevertheless, there is something wrong with it. That brings us to our mystery package. Yay! Let's see what's in it, shall we? <clears throat> well, here we have two megabytes of memory which is, well, it was a dream back then, and it's four times more than the maximum memory expansion uh, that I had. It also has a real-time clock, and it uses this little button-shaped batteries that doesn't leak like the barrel ones do. To get full use of the uh, two megabyte of memory, however, you need to do some changes to the Amiga itself because the Amiga will only recognize up to a certain amount of memory. So there is some additionally goodies in here. Cables. And oh, instructions. <laughs> Always good to read the instructions. Ah, and back to the... Oh, this is the shipping note. And on the back side of the shipping note is this Gary adapter. You see the Amiga team, they named their chips. So you have Denise, Agnes, etc, Paula, which all handles uh, video, sound, uh, peripheral devices, everything to uh, get all that work off the CPU, so the CPU doesn't have to do all that work. Which is a 60, uh, Motorola 68000, by the way, so it's very uh, nice CPU. Very nice for uh, <laughs> coding, anyway. Uh, yeah, this is the Gary adapter. Uh, one of the chips uh, that controls the memory bus was controlled Gary. And Gary also controlled uh, some uh, floppy buses. But to get full use of the 2 megabyte on this chip, you need to modify Mr. Gary a bit. So, 
this carry adapter is for it and there is some cables that goes between these two in the cable in pack here there is also an additional uh, thing that you can do to get uh, fast ram uh, and you have well the instruction just says go to the website for this uh, mod and uh, but how how to get the base uh, to uh, meg of memory is uh, it's all here and it has some nice pictures as well so i'm just gonna follow the instructions so this is how it works if you have the Amiga 500 Revision 5, as I do, you have 512 megabytes of RAM on the motherboard itself. It can maximum recognize a memory expansion of additionally 512 uh, kilobyte of RAM. So in total, you can fit the machine with one megabyte of RAM. However, if you use this Gary adapter, and have Kickstarter 1.3 or more. Kickstarter is the, in a modern computer, you would call it BIOS, I suppose. So if you have Kickstarter 1.3 or higher and use this Gary adapter that I just showed off, then you get 1.5 megabyte out of the expansion board, plus the 512 kilobyte you already have in the computer, which adds up to a two megabyte in total. If you also have the right version of a chip called Agnus, the Agnus chip, then you can get the full 2 megabyte out of this expansion board. However, it requires you to solder a jumper wire uh, to the Agnus chip in a certain way. If you want to know more, I will leave a link in the description to the manufacturer of this uh, expansion board. So you can uh, check if it works with your Amiga. Uh, from what I can see on the website, uh, it works with Amiga 500 Revision 3, Revision 5 and Revision 6A. And it also works with the Amiga 500 Plus Revision 8A. However, if you want to buy this, just check the link in the description and you can see if it works with your computer or not. So first things first, what do I need? Well, you see me use a flathead screwdriver to open the trap door under the Amiga just to get the old memory module out. I'm going to need a Phillips screwdriver to open it. And my Amiga, once you opened it, have some torque screws inside. I'm not sure if all the revisions of the Amiga have that uh, because my 500 plus only have Phillips screws once you are inside, but this one have Torx and it's a T10. And this one for pulling out Gary and putting him into the Gary adapter. So on an Amiga 500 there are six screws to open it five of them are here along the bottom and then uh, oh sorry three of them and additional three are over here one here one here and one here uh, i'm gonna start with these i have already taken this out because well uh, on my amiga it falls out once you turn the amiga upside down so it was very easy Well, this is boring to watch, so I'm gonna fast forward. Ah, yes, and then uh, the other screws are here. One, two, three. Then what I do, I usually just hold it together with both my hands and flip it around. Uh, I find that being the easiest way. And then you just lift off the clothes. Da da da, naked computer. 
take notice how the keyboard cable is connected uh, because if you connect it the other way around, turn it 180 degrees, you will not be able to start your computer. I did this and I spent half a day trying to figure out what was wrong until I noticed this was the wrong way. So it's always a good thing to take a picture before. Then it just slides off. And to open the RF shields, there are little things that you need to bend up here, either using your nails or use a little flathead screwdriver. Or you can uh, use whatever method you are most comfortable with. I don't know, I don't care. In my model, you need to loosen these torque screws here, 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 and here. There are four of them. I have seen Amigas where they use four Phillips screws instead, so just see what you have in your machine and use the appropriate tool to open it. And here is a little protective thing for the Zorro expansion port. You know, all the, all the Commodores had this user expansion port where you could put whatever you wanted. And I think it's nice that the, when Commodore started selling Amigas, they kept that alive and they added this little user port. Well, you can actually open the plastic on the side here to get access to it without disassembling the entire computer. And there were lots of things built for it, or at least nowadays there is. I don't know how it were back in the days. Ah, yes. There goes the RF shield. Once you have opened it up, you can see all the funny names they have going on inside. So you have Fat Agnes, you have Paula, you have Gary, you have, well, here's the CPU, the Motorola 68000. You got Denise up here, this chip. You got the odd CIA and there is an even CIA as well. Legend says that um, the people who designed uh, the Amiga at the High Toro company named the chips after the girlfriends. I don't know if it's true or not. What I do know, however, is that the original Amiga, the Amiga 1000, didn't have the Gary. And Gary basically st stands for Gate Array. So, no, no one was gay. Uh, at least none that I know of. The original Amiga 1000 had this as discrete logic, means there were lots of logic gates everywhere. And in the Amiga 500, they consolidated all of that and put it inside the gate raid Gary instead, making it cheaper and easier to handle. Here's the Zorro expansion port. And here's the memory expansion port, where the memory module will go. In the instruction for the memory expansion, it says that if you have an Amiga 500 revision 3, you have to do some adjustments to the memory module itself. If you have, like me, however, a revision 5 motherboard, well, then you can just go ahead and skip those extra steps in the instruction. So the first thing I'm going to do is to take out Gary and put this little adapter underneath him and just to enable the extra memory. So I don't know people who pack things in wrap plastic like this. I find it extremely hard to open. Ah, there we go. So the idea is put this where Gary is, put Gary on top and use these extra pinouts to the memory module. So time to bring out my trusty old IC puller tool. I don't know the proper name for this. So I just put it here and here and then 
Well, I'm carefully, without bending any pins, trying to pull out Gary. Um, yeah, I don't want to destroy Gary, so let's pull very slowly. And if you do this on your own, please be careful. Because those chips, these uh, custom chips for the Amiga, they can't be bought new anymore. I mean, they are not manufactured anymore, so... If you break one, you have to find an old, new stock one to replace it with. And that can be both difficult and expensive. So please be careful. Oh, he's moving a little bit. Yep. And I didn't and any of the legs, that's nice. So in the instruction it says that this should be this way and uh, there is a picture in the instruction that you can see as well. Here it is with this uh, little uh, cable out pointing downwards. But if you are unsure you can also see this little notch here and uh, a little notch on the printed uh, circuit board here should line up with a little notch here here is a notch for gary so but i just look at the picture in the manual i think that's the simplest way let's carefully put this adapter in oh hey yep and it should be a little bit firm, but make sure when you push it in that no legs on the adapter are being bent. I mean, you have to look really at all the sides here to see that no leg is pointing the wrong direction before you force it in. So be careful with this one as well. Then we come to the Gary and there is a little nudge here in the packing of the Gary. And that should also line up with the notch here and on the printed circuit board. So just go ahead and pop it in like that. Yep. And as usual, no leg should be bent here or on the other side. Just make sure that it's making firm contact. Yeah. So the next step is to uh, uh, install these cables, uh, put the RF shield back on and install the menu module and test it. It doesn't matter which way you put it as long as you are consistent because here it's labeled pin 1 to pin 8 and on this it's labeled 1 to 8 as well. In the instruction it says that the brown one should be one, so why not? It's good color as any. Maybe it's industry standard to use brown as zero, I don't know. So just, I'm just gonna pop it in like that. Brown as one. Then this one should fit underneath the RF shield like that. Well. Let's see what happens when we put RF shield back on. Well, it should be like... Ah, there's a little hole here. Nice. So I found uh, that there is a little slot here where the cable can come out. And well, that was very convenient. I don't think that Commodore thought of <laughs> this when they built the machine, but very nice nonetheless. Uh, when you put the RF shield back on make sure that all these little metal clips come out where they should come out. Uh, you see this one pops out uh, but well, these two doesn't. So let's open up and see what's wrong. Let's bend them out a little bit so that they will pop out more easily. 
and try again. Yay, everyone loves trying again. Yeah, now they pop out. So just bend them in, bend them in, bend them in. And then just assemble everything back together. I'll be right back. Ah, so you two guys put this together for me. Well, that's very nice. Now let's try it out. So, I have this one. Oh, hang on, this is the old one. Ah, here it is. So, as you remember, the brown one is number one, and here it's labeled one and Eight. So, just be sure to put the brown one on that way. This battery holder here is for the real-time clock and I'm not going to use that function. Mainly for two reasons. Well, I don't need it. Second reason, I don't want to go to the hardware shop and buy a battery. This jumper and this jumper, though, is very important. So let's see what the manual says. Well, if you got an Amiga 500, then J4 should be open and x stick should be shorted. And the other way around for the A500 Plus. And this is a 500, so J4, it's this one, it should be open. Like that, and x stick up here should be short. Ah. Right, and then we just push it in, um, right, so a little bit of violence is required, ah, so <laughs> all done, now it's only testing, and I can hear you all yelling out there, all two persons who watch this. Well, how are you going to capture this? What screen capture device or magic are you going to use? And although I could probably use the RF output here or the RGB in output here and do some screen capturing, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to use this one. The original monitor to the Amiga 500 and I'm going to film directly off this just to give it a bit more retro feel. I just love the design of this mice. They don't make mice like this anymore. See, it's gorgeous. <laughs> the trezoid kind of tank design. Let's see if it works then, shall we? First, monitor, then computer. Well, it wants me to put in the startup disk, so let's do that. Workbench. Ah, now let's see, what does it say there on the top? It says 1934944, free memory, so it's 
in total 2 megabytes, 2 million bytes of free memory. That is the 512 kilobyte of the onboard RAM plus the 1.5 megabytes I got from the expansion. So that seemed to work well and it would be 2.5 megs free memory up there almost a little bit of the memory is used by the operating system but almost 2.5 uh, megabyte free memory would be shown there if I had the right Agnes version and could do the chip mod to uh, enable more onboard memory. Well, let's uh, play something, shall we? So what happened here is that the sound disappeared, my microphone stopped working for some reason. Uh, but I'm basically talking about playing A-Train, and I tried playing it before, as I said in the beginning of the clip, but I got error messages that I didn't have enough memory. There are two versions of this A-Train game. There is one high resolution version, and there is one low resolution version. And of course I'm gonna go with the high resolution one. You see the manual here? It's a very thick and nice manual. They don't make game manuals like this anymore. It's really a shame. Oh, a bit blurry there. Here are the floppies. Uh, one floppy for the high res version, one for the low res version. And here is a card which states the system requirements. And there is one system requirement uh, paragraph for a Macintosh version. And then the lower paragraph is for the Amiga version. And I am basically just reading out loud that um, 1.5 uh, uh, megs of memory is required for the high res version and 1 meg of memory for the normal low res version. I really like these big box games. Uh, I think they make great collectibles. And they are nice, um, uh, nice to put on your shelf and just uh, as a decoration as well. I connected the audio cable to the input screen there in case the uh, game had any sound. Uh, it didn't. Uh, it turned out the game didn't have any sound and well, maybe this is the reason why the microphone stopped working. I don't know. So I'm putting in the high-res version there and I'm trying to start it. So I noticed that when you put in the floppy that states high-res version, it just shows data and then the data folder is empty. So you actually have to start it from the low-res version and then uh, you have to choose that you want high-res. Yeah, it says, please insert volume A train disk one in any drive. Uh, so you have to switch floppies like this back and forth. And this is uh, really common for the era. I sometimes play games on my uh, Macintosh SC30 or my Macintosh Classic. And well, unless you install the games on the hard disk, you have to keep switching floppies back and forth all the time. So that's really common. Here I finally got into the game. Uh, I couldn't play the uh, high-res version anyway uh, because I didn't have enough onboard memory. So I guess I have to get a better Agnes version, a newer Agnes version uh, that can handle more memory and try with the chip mod. It's not the screen that is flickering, it's the camera that is struggling to uh, sync with the refresh rate of the screen. So 
I didn't notice any of this flickering when I was staring at the screen, but a camera doesn't work quite like our eyes. So it's, uh, I'm sorry for that, guys. Um, I'm just clicking around here, uh, trying to figure out how to play the game. It's a very complicated game. Uh, it's not only building tracks, you have to build uh, business areas and housing as well. And after clicking around for a while, I realized that I don't even own the tracks that are there in the background. So I guess, yeah, yeah, I can't build anything there because I, I don't know, maybe it's too close to something else. I really have to read the manual for this game. And as well as reading the manual, I have to find a better way of capturing the screen. Because I realize now, looking at this uh, in the editing room, that it's very annoying. Yeah, I'm trying to do something with the station buildings here. Uh, I really like this little watch that comes up. <laughs> it's so cute. I guess these are hospitals or no, it says commercial. So it's some shopping mall or something. And I could build one there, uh, right in front of the railway station. Great location. You can't see anything out from the station. And then I tried building a factory and I was baffled because I thought this was a train simulator kind of game or like uh, Railway Tycoon. If you have played the game Railway Tycoon, I thought that A-Trains was similar to that. But apparently it's more complex than that. Like you can also build factories and commercial areas. Uh, here I'm trying to place a train on the track. Little do I know that I don't even own the tracks. Yeah, not yet posted, says the railroad manager. So there I figure out that, oops, I don't own the tracks. Uh, no wonder I can't put train on them. I can, however, build stations. No, I cannot build stations. Ah, uh, because I don't own the tracks, of course. So now I'm trying to build some tracks, I think. Yeah, um, at this point I'm basically just giving up the game and thinking, oh, I have to read a manual uh, because I don't understand the interface. I don't understand the goal of the game. And, uh, well, uh, but it's it's very common uh, for this era. Oh, here's the manual. Uh, I really um, like this poem that is here in the beginning. Come you all-rounders, I want you to hear the story of a brave engineer. Old Casey Jones was the rounder's name. On a six-wheeler he won his fame. Caller called Casey at half past four. He kissed his wife at the station door. Climbed into the cab with his order in his hand. Says, this is my trip to the promised land. Through the South Memphis yard on the fly, he heard his fire boy say, you got a white eye. And the switchman knew by the engine's moan that the man at the throttle was Casey Jones. It had been raining some five or six weeks. The railroad tracks was like the bed of a creek. They loaded him down a 30-mile gate and through the southbound mail about eight hours late. Fireman hollered, Casey, you're going too fast. You run the blockboard like the last station we passed. Casey says, yes, but I think we'll make it though. For she's steaming better than I ever knew. Casey says, Fireman, don't you fret. Keep knocking at the firebox, don't give up yet. 
for I am going to run her till she leaves the rail, or make it on time with the southbound mail. Around the curve and down the hump, two locomotives were bound to bump. Fireman hollered, Casey, she's just ahead. We might jump and make it, but we'll be dead. Around this curve he spied a train, reversing his engine caused bells to ring. Fireman jumped off, but Casey stayed on. He's a good engineer, but he's a dead and gone. Poor Casey Jones, he was all right. He stuck to his duty both day and night. They loved to hear his whistle and ring of number three. And he came into Memphis on the old IC. Headaches and backaches and all kinds of pain are not apart from a railroad train. Tales that are earnest, noble and grand are all in the life of a railroad man. I think it's so funny that they put this uh, poem in the manual for this game. Uh, as I was saying earlier, it's a very common theme for games of this era to be extremely complicated with so many different variables to keep in your mind. Uh, I have another Amiga game called Midwinter and I can uh, start a new scenario and that's about it. I don't know how to go from there. Um, Voyages of Discovery, it's a bit more simple. Uh, I haven't played that game too much, but at least I can understand uh, how it works. Well, it looks like this episode is also turning into a two-parter. Not because I didn't have spare parts or because nothing didn't work, but simply because I need to read this manual in order to play the A-Train game. So I'm gonna call this episode how to install this memory module. Uh, if you want to purchase this yourself, I will leave a link to the manufacturer and this webshop in the description, so just go there and check it out. But Coming back to games, these kind of thick manuals uh, and very complicated games were common back then, especially on the Amiga. If you wanted to play simple games, you got an Atari 2600 or, well, later in 86, you got a Nintendo Entertainment System so you could play Super Mario and simple games like that. But if you wanted to play very difficult strategy games where you had to keep a uh, hundred different variables in your head at the same time you got an Amiga. A-Train is one such example. I have also tried Midwinter. I didn't understand anything about it. Uh, well, I understand uh, how to click around in the menu, but other than that, it was very difficult. And as you can see, the manual here is also very thick and in modern games the manual is kind of optional because if you want to read it you can but in these old games you have to read the manual to understand the game because there's no in-game tutorial like there is nowadays so midwinter uh, it's some kind of military strategy games. You have a bunch of uh, snipers and uh, very skiing. Well, I will just read the backside of it. Midwinter is a deep and compelling strategy game, original in concept and revolutionary in design. A new ice age grips the world, and along with fellow pioneers, you live on the Midwinter Isle the last habitable oasis on Earth. A very real trek looms large as invaders attempt to seize your sanctuary. Ooh, scary. <laughs> Controlling up to 32 characters. Listen to that, you can control 32 characters. And that is from a first point of view shooter. Controlling up to 32 characters, you just defend an immense, immense playing area of uh, 160,000 square miles. You can ski, 
hang glide, snow buggy or travel by cable car across stunning glacial landscape, shooting, sniping and sabotaging intruders. Featuring a unique 3D fully light sourced graphic system and unprecedented action sequences, Midwinter will keep you locked in the Ice Age for a long, long time. And it is for its time very impressive in its 3D graphics. It came long before the Nintendo 64, uh, but still it has kind of Nintendo 64 3D graphics. I mean, it's not the same engine, but it looks very impressive. But 32 characters from a first point, uh, first person shooter perspective, I mean, that's. You have to read the manual, you get my point. I have also tried Voyagers of Discovery. This one was a little bit simpler to understand. And, well, the manual isn't as thick as the other game, so it's a simple game. Nonetheless, it comes on four floppies. And the point is that you should uh, sail around, uh, well, first get the crew and get the ship, and then sail around and uh, discover the world. In Voyages of Discovery, enjoy a complex trade simulation and strategy game. You are taken back to the days of discovering new continents, establishing colonies and trading relationships. Ships transporting goods and settlers around the globe. Missions, plantations and pirates on the high seas. Travel through fantasy worlds randomly generated. Well, randomly generated worlds was not common at this point in time. So, that's pretty cool. And enjoy being an explorer in an unknown world full of promise and opportunity. Full sails ahead in search of glory and fame or in fortune. You can lead your you can lead your motherland to becoming it says lead your motherland, but I think it means leave your motherland. You can leave your motherland to becoming one of the most influential power in trade, warfare and economic and social politics. Oh <laughs> sorry. Can you lead your motherland to becoming the most influential power in trade, warfare, and economic and social politics? Yes, I can. And I think when I try this, that you can choose between leading Spain, England, France, or what was the fourth one? It was a fourth option, but I don't remember it. Uh, can you build the most? far-stretched empire and take a place in history next to Christopher Columbus and James Cook. Yes, I can with my trusty Amiga 500, I can. For one to four players. Oh yes, that's also one thing. Uh, there are four countries, uh, Spain, France, England, and I don't remember the fourth one. And you have to play minimum one of them. Uh, you can play all four of them, then you take a turn. It's a turn-based game. Um, but if you choose to play only one, then at least one other country has to be the computer, so it has to be minimum two players. <clears throat> Intelligent computer-controlled competitors, superb animated graphics with a historic atmosphere. Yeah, this is uh, also kind of uh, a learning game, I would say, because you play the character of Christopher Columbus or of James Cook. Um, so you are the character and do you learn a lot about them and about the history of their mother countries. Uh, 256 colors on PC and 64 colors on Commodore Amiga. Well, 64 <laughs> colors ought to be enough for anyone, am I right? Easily playable due to user-friendly mouse control interface. Well, it's not easily playable because you have to read the instructions inside, nonetheless. 
6,400 field maps with random generator. Go back in time with voyages of discovery and become part of history. So, I think this deserves an episode in itself. In fact, I'm gonna do a series of these game reviews. So, yeah, just hang tight. Uh, we call this episode to an end. I will figure out a better way uh, of doing the screen capturing, maybe through the RF output or something else. And once I got the screen capturing set up properly, and I have read the manual of A-Train, I will do a review of it, or maybe more of a showing of uh, what the game can do. Not so much review, just clicking around and explaining the game. I will do the same for Voyages of Discovery! And maybe the same for Midwinter, I'm not sure, I didn't like that game that much, but if I read more about it and how to play it, I might like it more. And yeah, if I find any other uh, nice Amiga games to play, I can uh, probably review them as well. So, until next time, ta-da! <laughs>